Hello, hello, welcome. Hi. Here. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a Red Hen and Pronto event, and we're here to celebrate the release of Catherine Ross's book, Black Was Not a Label. Um, I'd like to dedicate my portion of the reading to Elijah McLean and all the other slain since 1619. Um, since seeing and learning about him, I was very disappointed that I didn't know about what happened to him almost a year ago now, but I can't not not think about it. So as we think about black voices and what it means to be black in America today, I want us to be remembering him. So before uh, for us to get started and again, celebrate Catherine's book coming into the world, I'd like to start with a poem. The first poem of my book, Testify. This one's called Loud Looks. You better rap, my brother says. He can beatbox his ass off. Got DJ scratches and spins. We'll drop it on the two and the four, the three and the four, whatever you need. Me posing my bars. My flow's a second to none. Come here, son, and see how it's done. Wanted to be a rapper? Check. Thought I was going to the NBA? Check. Father went to prison? Check. Brother two? Check. Mother died when I was eight, check. Hung pictures of Luke Perry on my bedroom walls. What? Yep, give me a bit and I'll sprinkle some subjectivity on it. I love that dude, his whisper voice, his lean. My auntie worried on the phone. Girl, he got some pictures of some white boy hanging all over his bedroom walls. Me rocking out the Tom Petty's you don't know how it feels. Silent head nods do more than throw shade. All black people are fluent in silence. A mangled James Baldwin quote, well, let's keep wrenching. Everyone's fluent in silence. You know what a switchblade glare means? No need to read the look my auntie gave as those white man's lyrics flung out my mouth. All right, thank you so much, Douglas. That's that poem is amazing every time. I also want to dedicate um, some of my readings to all of those slain since 1619. I especially want to shout out Toyin Salu. Um, might be saying her name wrong, but um, same with Elijah McLean. Ever since I learned about her story, I just can't not think about it. So just want people to remember that these are not just names, these are people. And so we need to remember them. So following Loud looks, which again, just so good. I'm going to be reading part of my essay, Ghost World One Heritage. We're going to start off with a quote from Alex Haley, author of Roots. In all of us, there is a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we have come from. Without this enriching knowledge, there is a hollow yearning. No matter what our attainments in life, there is still a vacuum and emptiness and the most disquieting loneliness. Heritage. For a moment after I realized I was a living, breathing person, before I grasped the full scope of that personhood, I did not know there was a veil between me and the world I was growing up in. What I mean is, I had no concept of Black. Now, there are times when I close my eyes and see brown bodies hanging in trees light skin to deep dark brown, ropes around their necks. And I watched them knowing it might have been me had it not been for the few decades between their births and mine. It might have been me, thin brown body, bruises under my eyes and ashen lips, head lolling stiff from a thick brown rope, the bones in my neck broken, pushing against the skin in grotesque iterations of how they're supposed to lay, how they're supposed to stand straight in the absence of the weight bowing me down as I pass through the womb. The understanding of my blackness came at a time when there was already a stigma attached to the word and description in my mind. I cannot say where or when I learned the stigma or how exactly I attached it to myself, allowed it to be attached to me. But I do remember the first thought of what and who I am as a sudden drop on a roller coaster, stomach falling upwards and an abrupt surprise, not fully unpleasant, but not entirely welcome. As I grew and learned of bat mitzvahs, quinceaneras, and debuts, I felt an emptiness in my culture and my race. I thought of holidays and rites of passage held close by different cultures pitted against those attributed to Blacks. 
how our days are largely created from lack or else markers of the end of some racial trauma. We jumped the broom because our marriages meant nothing while we were slaves. Families were ripped apart like one might separate a litter of puppies from their mother. Children spread across the country, married women raped and forced to breed to create better, stronger slaves, a worthy return on investment. We clutched Juneteenth to our chest because it is the day the white man gave us back our liberty, our humanity. Yet for years afterwards, we were told where to drink, where to walk, where to sit, where to live. We were sprayed by hoses and hydrants, swept like garbage in the street for rising again on weary legs, hearts pounding with fear, with stalwart resolve. There is no question our celebrations and traditions are important and worthy, but I can't seem to reconcile their origins. We celebrate that we remained human when the world tried its hardest to make us believe we are not. Is that not something to celebrate? To cry and say it is, of course it is. But I cannot, will not, Forget that for us, there is no celebration just for celebration's sake. Like freedom, all we hold was given by the hands of those with no right of ownership to begin with. Every piece of beauty, every accomplishment comes from a culture of sorrow, a code of deletion. Pain fuels this beauty, fuels art that contradicts the notion that we are not intelligent, innovative, creative. How many times have I heard the words, the first African-American? But here I must take pause. Sudden and jarring like a slamming door or a clap of thunder, I remember being 18 and in college when African-American and Black were no longer synonymous. The only brown body in the room, I tried to explain that I am not African-American after being labeled as such again and again, after my professor had me say nigger for no other reason than I should not be afraid to say it. The truth is my veins carry more white blood than Black. The genes all mixed together both forcefully and voluntarily the blood of Creoles in Louisiana, of the French, of white masters. The truth is I cannot tell you ever where I come from. I cannot tell you who my people are outside of this country. I cannot tell you what African province my ancestors shuffled forth from, driven like animals rather than walking straight backed and proud. But who could walk proudly into the hull of a ship? Who could hold their head high as they crawled atop the brown body of another before yet another brown body crawled atop them? Goodness, goodness. Catherine, your work is always so moving to me. Um, one of the first things, you know, I realized while reading your text is just how well it shows the precarity of black bodies, how we're just always in danger. And also how we have this just a race history, how, you know, we can't get back to our origins like we'd want. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, so often, and I know you, you and I have talked about this, that we have more than our pain, you know, but our pain yeah. is so defining of Black identity. So just anything you could say about the precarity of Black bodies to, and like a, kind of our race of history and how do we find personhood and group strength with all this erasure and all this pain? I think it goes back, um, I know we talked about County Cullen last time we spoke, and it, I mean, it always goes back to him for me, where, you know, his famous line, why would God make a poet black and bid him sing? And that kind of brings into the debate of, are you a black writer or are you a writer? And when you are a black person who's a writer, you can't separate those two, because just as much as you might want to write fantasy or science fiction, you also write about your pain. You also write about the trauma you've experienced in America, the trauma of your ancestors, the trauma of those around you. There's no way to separate those things from your own lived experience. And I think it's so easy to erase that because some people don't want to talk about the hard things. Some people don't want to have to talk only about, you know, racial traumas that they've experienced in their lives because it's hard. It's exhausting to talk about it's something that you don't wanna to have to remember every time you get up on the stage to talk or every time you pull out your book to read or every time you look up a black author. And while we can do both, I think there is like a duty for us to still do both. Like we can't pick or choose one or the other. Um, like we were talking about, like I'm working on another manuscript which is mostly speculative fiction. I'm not intending it to be very racially driven, but because that is my lived experience, I know it's gonna show up in the, in the text at some point. I mean, I, that's not what I'm setting out to do, but that's not also not how I'm setting out to live. It just is. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I always think about that Gwendolyn Brooks quote when she says her walking down the street 
is to act as a political act, you know, just because of yeah. the black body. So everything yeah. we do is always imbued with our blackness and our identities always get there before us. And I just think that, you know, your manuscript just illustrates that so well. Thank you. Um, I think now kind of trying to pivot off and almost make this freestyle status like you and I are in a cypher right now, dropping ball, uh, dropping verses. Yeah, gonna, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm going to go ahead and get you with uh, this poem is not black. It's the title of this. This poem isn't black. I am not myself. I am sleeping on the back seat of my brother's white Jeep Cherokee. Crack under the seat. Crack flooding his blood. Hard to tell memory from the real. I am trying. Trying to make this image tar. But I don't want to be leashed only reading this poem on Martin Luther King Boulevard. Brightness leaping from the Cherokee. My brother, he always tells me, you be acting white. Those words skin me down to the white meat. I really love that poem. And I want to ask, because that's something I've experienced so much in my own life, people telling me you're always acting white or you want to be white. Um, can you remember like a specific time when that was first said to you? Like, would it be in this poem in that moment? Or how old are you? And like, what were you doing to bring about that, that statement from someone else? Yeah. Um, first time, I don't know for sure, but I do remember uh, when... Uh, goodness, I'm going to date myself and show how old I am back when MTV showed videos. And I remember that I would always like has loud looks uh, describes. I'd always be listening to music. And I remember that I am uh, watching music videos and such. And I remember um, listening to I think it was Guns N' Roses November Rain because that video is like forever long. And I feel like I remember it was probably my auntie walking by and just like, chicken neck and being like what and like what you doing listening <laughs> to that white boy music and then just from there on like i always went to uh i went to catholic school growing up so it was always kind of a doubling thing that was happening to me at all times um my um not very many people in my community went to the same school that i went to so like i was kind of a doug at home and a doug mm -hmm. at school and so mm -hmm. I think very early on, people would tell me I, I was acting white or that I was a nerd like um i realized that um my friends and people around me, a lot of my peers had some cultural capital of blackness that I was somehow lacking in. And that ends up kind of being um, almost besides the death of my mother and um, my father and brother's uh, fight with drugs and falling victim to the crack epidemic. I think that that and maybe my loss of religion is the kind of main or I guess um, complicated <laughs> feelings about religion ends up being the kind of main thrust of why testify even happened and perhaps mm -hmm. why I even like became a writer in general is trying mm -hmm. to uh, figure out how to be a black man that i'm comfortable with being while everybody in my life has always told me i'm not black enough hmm. i feel like everything you said i feel that so deeply like that being like measured by a modicum of blackness that you don't you don't measure up to because I mean, there is no, there is no real blackness. Like whatever you are doing right now is what a black person would do because you were a black person doing it. Same, whatever I'm doing right now, like that's what a black person would do. There is no idea of like what we should or shouldn't be doing, but then there is an idea of that. And it starts so young. I just remember being a kid. And I think one of the biggest things for me was that I love the Beatles and everyone was like, how you know, how can you like the Beatles? It's such a white band, like like such white music. And I know that's something my parents have dealt with all their lives as well. Like they both have been told that like, my mom loves Elton John, and that was always like a thing for her. People were like, "Oh, you like that white boy? Like, what are you doing?" And the day we were talking about it, and she's like, "He's it's good music. Like Elton John is good music." And that's part of like what brought my parents together is that they were able to just enjoy the music and not look at each other and say like, oh, you're not black enough because of this. And I think that's so important to find those people who can recognize that in you and like not write it off as like, oh, you're trying to be something you're not. Like, it's just, it just is. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Like that's, I feel it thank so you. deeply. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's wounding. It definitely is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, so I'm going to jump back into the rest of Ghost World One Heritage. I remember saying that I am not African American because I have never known Africa. And I remember a white boy, sickly pale with flat colored eyes, nodding at me proudly, saying that someone finally got it. That African American was only a politically correct phrase used by guilty whites and not the truth. I remember looking back at him and seeing the momentary discomfort in his face as our eyes met. The disbelief I felt at his words, at his audacity to confirm my feelings and perceptions based on a politically correct technicality washed over me. But it was strangely muted, a dulled knife with just enough sharpness to sting but leave the skin unbroken. I wondered what could have spurred him to speak, to insert himself into a space where only my voice belonged. I wondered if, in his eyes, I was the first African-American to have understood this about themselves, if I was the first African-American to figure it out. I think of the Great Sphinx, the why and when and how of destroyed no sits as the post historical mystery, but I wonder where and why there's any debate at all. Is it such a stretch to think that this nose, this outlier of racial evidence, might have been destroyed to hide the truth of the civilization? Brown bodies and broad features erased from history's memory until it was normal for a young black boy to grow up and believe the Egyptians, too, were white. I think of a video in the Southern California Natural History Museum recreating what King Tutankhamun might have looked like, my dark eyes accepting his depicted milky skin, thin lips, and pointed nose as truth and fact. I think of how this is part of our culture of sorrow, erasure of the self by the other, leading to erasure of the self by the self. How else could they justify the lie that we had subhuman intelligence, subhuman souls? How else could they enslave the people whose brown body brothers and sisters created and solved equations, who aligned the pyramids to mirror the stars? Sometimes when I close my eyes, I still see brown bodies hanging in trees. I see brown bodies hanging in trees, heads bowed and chins reaching for chest, and she whispers to me, tells me not to eat the strange fruit. My mother might have worked in the house and my father in the field and my sister with my mother and myself with my father and where is my God? I inherit rage, sorrow, deletion, death. I inherit displacement, a blind woman walking with the veil like scales over her eyes. The past is cloaked in a thick pall that is me asking what celebrations my eye have inherited from my people. What days, what festivals, what rites of passages are lost in the silent annals of our murky past? It was not enough to see the lies or the way I swallowed them. It was not enough to feel simultaneously shame, simultaneous shame and pride in my body, the striking length, the beautiful texture of my hair, the self-same lightness and darkness of my skin, the thick curvature of my lips, the lift of my cheekbones, the slight arc of my brown black eyes. Who constructed this face? Or where did these features come? Who handed my eyes down to my father's parents, to my father, to me? Who gave my nose, my smile, to my mother's parents, to my mother, to me? Who were the brown bodies who lay with the other brown bodies to create my grandparents, my parents, me? And who were the white bodies forcing their way into the brown bodies into a line that might never have known them had their ships with empty gaping hulls remained on northern shores? These white bodies loosened the coral in my hair, lightened the hue of my skin, left an inheritance of unmerited pride and shame in my body pride and fear for my body. There is more white blood than black blood in these veins, but there are strands in my DNA woven with intention, laced with resilience and persistence. There are genetic codes buried so deeply that variations of darkened skin and coiled hair will persist forever, shaping faces and ordering cells so they recall the brown bodies taken from the shores, set to the fields, hung from the trees. I am a lost daughter calling out to distant mother, calling out to Father God asking where I ever belonged, asking who I was supposed to be. Goodness, I've asked where I belong and where I'm supposed to be to myself so many times when you kind of straddle worlds the way you and I both have had to straddle worlds, or I guess more aptly the way race ideology makes people like you and I have to straddle both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that really struck me with reading your text is how you how the speaker learns to love themselves and fully and their features from nose to lips to hair all of it and in so many ways i feel like this text is like a, a self-love kit if you will 
And I love that because it's so empowering and beautiful. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that journey from shame to triumph um, and how being able to embrace those figures and be able to, uh, features and being able to, you know, know, <laughs> look at the, the pyramids and, and, and then say that um, the Sphinx and then be able to say, you know, like Beyonce and Jay-Z talk about the love that knows and, and love that missing knows it's there and know that it was like taken away for a reason uh, mm -hmm. to uh, cripple our pride. So yeah, anything you could say about that, my dear friend? Yeah, it's hard to know where to start. Um, I know from just childhood, I have a, like, a lot of internalized racism about the way I look, about, I guess, my features, my hair. Um, and not, we're not going to get to it today, but like one of my favorite essays in this book is where I talk about cutting my hair. And so good. It's so, <laughs> yeah, good. It's so and good. It's so good. That was just that was such a defining moment of my life because I, I never like, you know, I never wore a weave. I never had extensions or anything, but I naturally had really long hair and to take care of it, we had it relaxed and so we had to keep it straightened. And that was something done out of necessity. That was something done because I'm like horribly tender headed. And it was like a fight every week. My mom had to do my hair and the brushing and the combing and I had my hair long like that up until I was 18. And I I just, I always felt so ugly, to put it bluntly. I always felt so, so ugly. And I always felt like I wasn't myself and I wasn't being myself. And I always felt like it wasn't good enough because people would either question my hair to like no end, or they would like grossly praise it to the point where it was like, it was only beautiful because it was straightened in that moment. I started braiding it sometimes so it would be curlier when I went out. And then when it was like that, they're like, oh, your hair's so frizzy today. Your hair's so like big, why are you doing that? And so I think it just was part of it. It has been like moments where I'll come across old pictures of myself and I'll come across like pictures of my friends and my family and I'll see myself and I'll say, I was really pretty then. And I just remember being in those moments and thinking how ugly I felt and how ugly I thought I was, especially in comparison to my friends who, you know, had light skin and long hair. And my, my friends have always been pretty diverse. I would say I was like friends with a lot of Latinx people, Asian people, white people, but it was like, I was the thing and not like the others. And it was like so ingrained in me that I couldn't ever let it go. And so when I cut my hair, part of it was just like reclaiming myself and just like, claiming the beauty of my natural hair and like now i just i love my curls like my cousin sometimes she's like oh you should just straighten it to see how long it is and i'm just like no i want to leave it <laughs> and, um, it's just like it's just it's such a small thing but then it's not because you know black women have such a long history of struggle with their hair and with their beauty especially because we are like so far from the standard of beauty in most of the world and yeah, it's still a long journey. Like I'll still have the default moments where I'm just like, oh God, I'm like, I look so gross or I look so awful. But then I have to remind myself like, you know, in two years, you may be looking back at a picture from today and think, oh, look how pretty I was then. I wish I had just known it then. I wish I had just like told myself that instead of like feeling down and bad about how I look because I'm internalizing all these things that I'm not, things I can never be, I can never be because I wasn't born to look that way. And it's okay, just because it's not a standard of societal beauty doesn't mean that it's not beautiful. And I see that so much in my friends, like when they say stuff like that, I'm like, you're crazy, like what's wrong with you? But then it, when it comes to turn the mirror on myself, I'm like, yeah, okay, I see where they're coming from. I see why it's so hard. And I see why it's so important to, you know, it's so important to just keep negating that script that you're not negating that script of internalized racism because it goes so far back and so deep. Goodness, I love that turn of phrase, negating the script. That's such an awesome turn of phrase. Um, I, I can identify with you in the way that, I mean, everybody always talks about my, that my mama had good hair. Like everybody always says that to me all the time. Boy, your mama had good hair. And just how much cultural capital is in that. Um, it's just, um, it's sad. It's sad that yeah. we're holding everybody to all these standards and that the good hair has to be Europeanized. Right, right. yeah. Like it's sad. But 
all of this is so complicated and nuanced. And I think that's kind of my relationship to religion currently. And also another poem kind of showing the doubleness of how, you know, you and I have had to walk through this world um, and going back to religion. Um, so this one is called, are you ready to help the parents of this child and their duty as Christian parents? My godmother answered yes and traced the sign of the cross on my forehead. I'm driving to see her. Pines blotching the side of the road. I want Cindy to stay young. She uses a walker now. An old woman, curly hair and wrinkled hands soft as feathers. In her backyard, we feed birds bread. Pigeons so close we could christen them. Wrens and wobblers conjugate. Cindy drove me to church every Sunday after my mother died. Before I leave today, she'll make me recite the rosary in the parlor, sunlight revealing new lines on her face. We don't go to church anymore. She doesn't travel well. Christmas and Easter, the only times we step inside St. Mary's. Make a wish, she says. A cardinal just landed red cap sharp as the Pope's hat. Cindy was mother's catechism sponsor. She remembers her voice. I can't. This pecks at my head. So I tell her, but I've never told her how I call her my fairy white godmother. Never admit it that I no longer believe. Yet, as always, when we go inside, I light the votive candles. I want to say it's, I, I really love this tension you have with religion because it is such a deep tie in the Black community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is something that is so interwoven into the lives of Black people, just going back generations. Um, a book I'm like forever bringing up is Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus. And it's like an amazing read where it just talks about how Christ is such a deep part of like the African American or just you know, like the black mm -hmm. identity because they he they see him as a coat sufferer. Mm -hmm. But then you also see the nuances like of Catholicism where there's a lot of tension and a lot of shame mm -hmm. that's can be found in that faith iteration. And it's just it's really interesting to kind of see that tension that you have of like being raised Catholic, being raised in a more Eurocentric view of Christianity or view of like Christ following and how you kind of moved away from it but you have these these you have these memories that are so deeply ingrained in you that are so deeply ingrained in your upbringing and it's just really fascinating is there like is there is there a moment that you can point to where you were like I don't believe in this anymore or I don't see this the same way or what you were saying about like how it's so nuanced that you can't just like accept the one thing is true. Yeah, um, I think for me that a big moment was uh, when I was in confirmation classes, um, when I became a soldier for Christ, uh, the last step in initiation in the, into the Catholic Church. And I just remember going through those classes and uh, this is in high school for me, and that was that was the first time when I just really started thinking about like how Eurocentric Catholicism was. And then also I just got to thinking that so much of what I was feeling was supposed to be a sin and so much shame. Like, you know, when you're a teenager, a teenage boy, you're so in your body and desires and feelings. Well, teenagers in general, like that's not gendered whatsoever, just so in the bodies and stuff like that. And it just felt so weird to like deny so wholeheartedly that part of myself and coupled that with just like, you know, my brother and other family members had access to, you know, to more Afrocentristic uh, practices of religion and just like notions of like a white Jesus or a white God or even a male God, like all seems so um, short sighted and myopic to me. And even in high school, it just all felt. Yeah, it felt like something to control people. And I, I think I was very mm -hmm. rebellious in high school, well, at least wanting to be. Um, and so, yeah, it was like another way of me defining myself against something else. So I think that's why it ended up meaning so much. But then when you go to mass <laughs> two times a week for, I don't know, 
uh, what was it, maybe 16 years. Like, it's so a part of you, you know? Like, so I think, you know, I always tell people, I'll always be culturally Catholic. Like, uh, I, uh, for the longest time, um, I was a janitor at Walmart in undergrad. And uh, a woman who worked with me, uh, Marcia, she came up to me one time and she said, Douglas, uh, uh, God told me to pray for you. And she gave me this crucifix and I kept it in my wallet forever. And, you know, I don't practice um Christianity in any kind of formal sense anymore, but I could never let it go just because of how meaningful that is. And I think, you know, my whole life will always be imbued uh, with, uh, you know, Catholic notions. Like, you know, I always say, if you look at me wrong, I'll feel guilty. Or if I, whenever I say something, I just always feel uh, this massive weight of guilt. Um, but I do think you're right. Like Jesus and uh, Black Jesus, you know, uh, uh, Eve Ewing has that wonderful essay about Black Jesus, which is just mm -hmm. so incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, and 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 I and I do. I think that I do kind of believe in Black Jesus, like she said, like not Jesus like that, but Black Jesus of like you know that kind of model. And you know, it goes back to that kind of dilemma. And I really love your text for being able to show the doubleness that Du Bois talks about with double consciousness so much. But there's another doubleness of the church in the streets. You know, like in the fire next time. Uh, no, actually, in Go Tell It on the Mountain for Baldwin, mm -hmm. um, they. Um, when the street, uh, when a woman comes up to the speaker and says, whose little boy are you? And talks yeah. about that either you're going to be of the streets or you're going to be of the church. And so that and dynamic. That poem, your poem was just like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, but that your poem where you have that line there, it's just, oh, so, it's uh, so good. Well, and I also, mean, just real quick, I wanted to um, point out your other one about, I think it was about your confirmation where you talk about your father kind of like looming in the back. Oh, like yeah. Father, like, that really struck me because I was like, is this like a, play on like like satan what is this exactly is this like the shadow of like pressure of religion over you like that poem really hit me when i was reading it, it the imagery was so strong uh, thanks thanks yeah. i i mean again i think a lot of it was kind of rebelling against any kind of father because you know a lot of my book is about a failure of meta narratives you know like i feel like i was told a lot of stories that i that people thought would just uh, would help me get through, would uh, give me the strength to make it, would fortify me in some way. And most of my young adult life and late teen years was thinking that those stories aren't really serving me like the way people thought they would or would do me any good. So that's what mm -hmm. a lot of this ends up being about. But yeah, mm -hmm. that dynamic between the, the streets and the churches, you know, evident in the black community for so long of, of like which way you're going to go. And I think that was definitely part of my coming of age process. Yeah, and that um, that kind of helps lead into what I'm going to read next. So my next one is going to be another Ghost World um, installment. So there are three of them in my book, and they're mostly out of order. But for our purposes, it will be in order. <laughs> but I just say, like, I I wasn't raised Catholic. Um, my mother was, and she often said she's a recovering Catholic because now she has like her own personal relationship with Christ and she's like able to see like I'm not this horrible dirty person who cannot look at him like I can have a relationship with him and I was lucky enough to grow up believing and knowing that and so yeah I mean I have some very close friends that have been raised in more strict religions and I can see how deeply it hurts them and I find myself very lucky that I wasn't like given those notions but I can see how deeply it goes and how many people struggle with that and how like it affects them years and years on. Um, but yeah, for my, I mean, my own faith is very imbibed into my work. And in this essay, I'm just talking about how, um, I guess I'm trying to have a conversation with God about what feels to be unfair, about his choices and how he made me and the choices of where he placed me and when. So this is Ghost World 2, Womanhood. The cruelest thing God could have done, he did to me lovingly. Needle and thread in hand, he stitched me together, breathed into my nostrils, brought forth my first cry, and made me a black woman. Through the eyes he gave me, I see a genocide of brown people by brown people. A massacre turned both inward and outward, conducted most cruelly with the withholding of love, the impossibility of desire. An inferiority complex turned self-hatred turned mantra that whispers again and again, you are not worthy of the unconditioned, unfettered love you desire. 
This genocide begged black and brown men and women to erase brownness in their children, their grandchildren, adding white paint until black is gray is white again. I have heard mothers tell their young brown boys and girls they are not to bring home a dark lover, a black lover, a brown lover. I have heard voices from other branches, other roots of my familial tree say boldly that we need to lighten the race. Find someone like you, but not dark. I ask, what is dark? Is it simply anyone and everything that cannot be called light? I wonder, had God not been so cruel, if things would be easier? If all that he placed inside of me would shine brighter, speak louder? I wonder if love would not be offered to me like scraps. I wonder if the black and brown men and boys who had pursued me, claimed they liked me, loved me even, would not have offered it like a favor, like I automatically owed them my attention and affection in return. They would not speak to me like I am being given something I could never earn, something I don't really deserve. I would not feel uneasy and afraid when they eyed me, would not turn my face from them, afraid to catch their eye, embracing myself for aggressive, unwanted attention that says I'm already theirs because I am brown, not because I am wanted. I'm a black girl who should know her place, intelligent, pretty even for such brown skin. An enigma wrapped in a contradiction, an exception just worthy enough for offhand affection. Who am I to dare turn them down? What do my feelings matter when they are giving me a pass? I wonder had I wonder had God been kinder if light-skinned men of every race would look me in the eye, if their desire would not be masked by their feelings for a black girl, that they would not incite fear and shame, if seeing me as someone beautiful, someone worth knowing, would not be exotic and outlandish, a phase that would soon fade away. I wonder had God chosen to spare me if I could be an option, truly seen and truly wanted. Not a pass or an experiment, not a source of shame, but a person, viable and whole. I think too of the couples I have seen, the ones set up with molasses and ivory, honey and coal, butter and copper. I think of their smiles, the way they seem to see deep into one another beyond the cages of different colored flesh. And I wonder if they have found a way past the internal genocide. How have they pushed past the stigma, the fear, the assumptions, the overt prejudice so much of the world sees as normal? I see them and think of seeing, really seeing your lover, of accepting every facet of their being, every physical attribute as a compliment to the soul you've chosen to love. How do these people, these couples, fight through God's love, his cruelty, and find one another? And will anyone ever find me? The first time I truly and completely fell in love, I found someone like me on the inside. I found someone who knew what it is to be brown, if not the same brown as myself. I found someone who saw and cared for my soul, prescribed it no color. I found someone who did not give me worth, but saw worth long and deep within me, reminded me it was there. I found someone who never told me I was beautiful, but made the fact known in small, quiet ways that made me glow from the inside. Love was soft and surprising, a young phoenix rising from a pile of ash, warm and small and fluttering, vulnerable and unsure, furtive glances and soft, careful touches. Words transparent and shimmering, extracted from the soul and presented to one another, a place with the other where we knew they were safe. He never so much as held my hand, but once or twice held me close to him, gentle. His touch so careful, I might have been spun from glass. The first time I truly and completely fell in love, it was because someone saw me, the hidden me, stifled and ignored since I learned brown and the shame attached to it. Someone saw me, and I've so rarely felt seen. Wow. Wow. No, I think the big thing for me that I, so many things I've said that I adore about this text, but the way that you directly confront colorism is so brave, so audacious. And it's always kind of the elephant in a room that black folks in public or in mixed company, if you will, are always walking around, uh, but it's always so there, like, you know, I remember hearing, you know, people talk about my mama being high yellow and how that was like capital that mattered that she had light skin and good hair and stuff. Or, you know, if I get if I was be in Arizona all summer and stuff, people would be like, oh, boy, you didn't came back all dark. You can't be doing all that. Like it's mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. just informed for everything. And I, I know, you know, I don't know if you get the if you're going to have the opportunity to read it today, but there's such a great moment in your text where, uh, well, it's kind of a revolving image of like where 
the speaker holds uh, her arm up to other black people or other white people in this kind of test of who's darker and the shame when it's with a white person who thinks they're almost as dark as you or the shame that one would feel if they're like happy that they're lighter than somebody. And I had a similar thing happen to me when I was in Africa, when I was in Eritrea, only it was a, a beautiful moment of like connection that um, um, one of the, uh, our guides, Samuel, put his arm against mine and he said, same brothers. And it was the blackest I've ever felt my whole life. And I don't feel black very often. You feel me if I'm being real um, uh, because of a lot of things I've done. So, yeah, I was just wondering if you can just talk like just a little bit before I jump into another poem of just about like the role colorism that has played in your life, because I know um, from reading the text that it is like a very dominant trope in, in the manuscript. Yeah, yeah. Um, it definitely has been something throughout my life, um, like my my mom is very light skinned. My grandmother is very light skinned. She honestly, she could have passed, but she chose not to because she's like kind of like how you're describing your mother. She's the good hair. She's very, very light skinned. Um, and then my father is just like average, you know, black American. He's, you know, brown. So my sister and I, she's lighter than me, like a couple shades. And I'm, you know, the darker one. And growing up, it was like, oh, she's the light one. You're the dark one. And I always felt so much like, negativity in that I always felt like oh, okay that also means I'm like the ugly one I'm the one who's not as good I'm the one who's like not as interesting or desirable or whatever and so seeing that come up just in school growing up it was I mean it's something that's kind of like ground into you all the time and I love that story that of you saying you're in Africa and he holds up his arm and says same because that would be like I guess just like remembering the experiences I've had if if I were to experience that in Africa, I would probably just like burst into tears. I did. It was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did. Same thing, but it's like it's so different. It's the same act, but the but the motive behind it is so different. And one makes you feel like you're ostracized, and the other makes you feel like you are accepted. Mm -hmm. And no matter how far apart you are, you're the same. And I think people kind of get mixed up in that when they like, they're like, oh, there's no race, there's only the human race. And I'm like, that's not what we're saying. Like, the, our differences and our colors are so important. I mean, the, the, we're created to be different and diverse. And that doesn't mean you ignore those things. So you, color blindness is not what we're going for. But to have negativity attached to color is also not what we're going for. And so to have a space where you're just like, we're so different, but we're the same. That's, I think that's where that's the sweet spot. That's where you want to be. Whether it's like you're in Africa or maybe, maybe I could go to Scotland. And someone will be like, you know, same. And I'd be like, yeah, we are the same, even though we're different. Um, and I think it's a little bit crazy into like a lot of my life, like when it comes to like dating, when it comes to like friendships, I don't ever stop and think like, oh, I don't want to be with this person because they're not this or because they are that. And I just think, I know like, I know for you too, because like being in an interracial relationship, like colorism becomes such a big thing. It becomes such a big thing, I, I guess, like maybe from your friends or other family members, or just like when you're in a mixed couple, it's like, what are you doing? Like, how does that work? And I think what people are missing is that when you just like connect with someone, those things don't matter. Like they're a compliment to the soul you've chosen to love, but they're not like, I love this person because they are white, or I love this person because they, Honestly, like if I had if I had men who were like, oh, like black queen, I'm like, mm, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't know if I like that. <laughs> it's like Slow it's down with that hotel stuff. <laughs> yeah, like, slow down a little bit there. Like, thank you, but wait. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think that's like just another iteration of colorism, and people fetishize people based on like how dark they are, how light they are, and when you do that, you're missing the person, and that's what gets me. And so because of colorism, just like in my own family and friends, friendships, um, some relationships, I feel like I feel like I've been missed. And that's what like breaks my heart the most because I feel like I'm so much more than this body that I'm in. And like my body matters, how I look does matter, but I'm like, it's not the end all be all of who I am. And so I feel like it's like kind of been like my mission to like relay that to people because it's so important to me. And I feel like so many people miss it. So many people miss it. And 
it's just so sad because you can miss people. You can miss really amazing people because they don't look the right way. So yeah, colorism, it's very deep and it's very painful. And a lot of us don't want to talk about it because of where we land on the spectrum of color. And when I was little, I used to be like, oh, I'm dark, so I'm ugly. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm brown and I love it. I don't care. Like, I don't want to be any different than I am right now because this is what I am and this is good. I love that. I love that. Again, like I said to everybody, buy Catherine's book. It is a self love kit, I promise. Um, but no, you got me close to the information for my poem, you know. Um, being in an interracial couple, um, America's always pulling you so many different ways. And there is there was so much I had so much shame about it for so long. And again, going to like kind of the the main one of the main tropes of my first collection is this not feeling black enough or feeling like that like uh, I was letting black people down by the kind of black dude I was being, um, which was a lot for me. But I think, you know, there's something really cool about standing in an interracial space and being in an interracial relationship of kind of clapping back at the powers to be and looking them in the eye. Um, and, you know, America always lets you know what time it is, as America has so often in these last couple months. And I think this poem is about one of the key times that America let me know what time it is. It's called Heading Down. We shouldn't raise mixed babies in the South. Kay says as I drive up the crest of another hill on our way into Kentucky. The South, where humidity leaves a sweat mustache, where a truck with a Confederate flag painted on the back windshield skitters off in front of us. In its bed, avoiding our eyes, a boy with blonde hair split down the middle like a Bible left open to the book of Psalms. His shirtless sunlit skin drapes, a thin coat for his bones, his clavicle sharp. I wanna know who's driving this raggedy truck. I want the boy to look at us. I wanna spray paint a black fist over that flag. I want the truck to find its way into the ravine. I want to. Stepping on the gas, I pass the truck. Kay and I turn our heads. The boy smiles and waves. The man driving doesn't turn his head. Keeps his eyes on the road. Kay turns red as she draws her fingers into fists. And with nothing left to do, I stare at the whites of her eyes. Um, it's so many questions popping up from just that poem. I know we can't get to all of them, but I guess how how do you deal with this? Like when you see these moments of things that are so commonplace to us, where we like Confederate flags, are like, yeah, I see that, and you hear these things, and they're not surprising, even though they're heartbreaking. But then you see your partner who's so shaken. Like, how do you? How do you deal with that? How do you bridge that gap of what's so normal to you and so shocking to her? I mean, we don't, it's a negotiation every day. You know, it's not like something that we were trained in or that like even school helps us with. It's something that we have found a language together with and, you know, has, there's been so many times where we've missed each other on this. But I think the, the main kind of thing for me is with Kay teaching gender theory and teaching women's studies, I think, you know, she understands multiple jeopardy and intersectionality in very interesting ways because of what she taught, what teaches. So she's actually taught me a lot and helped me be uh, not, uh, I always joke, you know, using a, a quote from Philip B. Williams that we're all recovering sexist. And, you know, she helps me in, in that category. And I try to, you know, um, shed light on um, spots of uh, racism that she didn't realize were happening. But with this case, you know, um, like with, you know, when the election happened, um, I'm always disappointed by white people's shock. When people were shocked about what happened in 16, when white people now are shocked about what happened to George Floyd, shocked what happened to Brianna, shocked that happened to Ahmaud 
Arbery. Like, I'm always just so appalled because this has been the TV show for us forever. And we've been saying the same stuff. Like, it's weird to me, you know, people are acting so surprised and so down to ride for, you know, different for police reform and defund the police now when, you know, we said fuck the police in like a rap song, like, you know, almost like <laughs> like 30 years ago. And then even before that, you know, like people have been like singing the song and like, you know, the people are just now getting to the party. It's just amazing to me. And so like, I'm always a little disappointed when people are shocked, when white people are shocked. And so, I mean, again, I think it's something that you work on again and again. And, you know, so much of black literature and is, you know, people when I was on a panel with the great Dan Z, Senna and um, Dana Johnson and Ishmael Reed, we talked about the, you know, sometimes people want from a black narrative redemption. And so much of it is not in our construct is not about redemption redemption or redeeming white folks or redeeming a black person or redeeming a reader, but it's about being in the muck and working through this hard, hard stuff, through yeah. this complicated, nuanced stuff. And I think that's the kind of um, approach that can I have with this, you know, is that it's messy. And the only way for us to exist in our love, you know, which has been, you know, 10, well, wow, 11 years, <laughs> you know, and there's been rough times, but it's rough. It's rough. And yeah. you work through it people decide to be together, but it's never easy. It's a tough yeah. conversation and it's always, and it bruised both of us. Um, I, I want it. I want it. I always want like to make eye contact with them as if that's going to change something. But I think it is very telling um, that I do remember that young man looking at us and smiling. And that's one of the weirdest, surreal, ultra real, overly real moments of my life. I don't know what that smile means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That when you read that part, I was thinking again of County Colin and his poem Incident, where yes. he was in Baltimore for like what nine months. Um, <laughs> and all and that's he all remembers, remembers. little white kids calling him a racial slur. And it's like it's it could like it, it binds itself to your soul almost. Like you just can't forget those moments where they're just so weird. They're yeah. so I don't know. They're just they just feel so surreal, I guess, what you said. It's just like, it feels like, is this real life? Like, what does this mean? Like, what am I experiencing right now? Yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah. yeah it's a trip. It is, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up womanhood. And then what you were saying just about in the end about wanting some resolve, like I'm gonna get to it when I read my last piece, but like, I've gotten that so much about my book where it's like, where's the happy ending? Where's the resolve? And I'm just like, I don't know. They want us to redeem them. They want us to yeah. redeem them. They want us to redeem them for the historical uh, legacy, which we inherited with this shit show that we're all sitting in. They want us to redeem them for it. And that's so mm -hmm. much to ask of us when we're so tired and doing so yeah. much and getting killed and our neck broke. It's, yeah. <laughs> the audacity. That's such a good word. I just, I love, I love the power of the audacity. Like, I just, that's how I feel. Cause I'm just like, it's almost like, you, I'm almost like links and he's like, you want to laugh to keep from crying. It's just like, really, really. And yeah, it's real. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Right. So this is Ghost World 2, Womanhood Part 2. This love was short-lived and sudden, a profound impact that struck me within me so deep under my skin. With a whimper, a gasp, the phoenix burst back into flame. The zeal of being seen had given way to partial blindness and we unraveled slowly at first and then all at once, coming to rest as something new but different in a way that hurt the smallest thing. The tears I cried for him were different than any I had cried before. Different than when in college, a black man old enough to be my father badgered me every day before and after our shared class to talk to him, to befriend him. He showered me with compliments, eyes wide and eager as he watched me squirm. He soon, he soon told me I was racist for not giving in, that I thought I was too good for a black man, that I was wrong for not just giving him a chance. Different than when a white man at my first university told me I was beautiful and exotic, sat so close behind me that each of his warm breaths settled like a noose around my neck, took offense when I told him off. Different than when in high school, the brown boy who said he loved me sent me 17 text messages detailing everything he hated about me because he couldn't have me. 
My presence, once a comfort, was something like a, but a nuisance to him. A source of pain turned to slow burning resentment and I crumbled beneath his loathing. But these new tears were the keening of a wounded animal, the response to the sudden tearing, the sudden snuffing as of a soft glowing soul. The first time I truly and completely fell in love and lost it, the phoenix reappeared, small and aching, the burning like a time of light against me. Gentle and quiet, some words were extracted from the depths of the soul and shared. Others held tightly in my mouth. I patted myself around him, stifled the wealth of emotion I felt for him, erected three or four inches of safety between his heart and mine. There were shadows in the way now, ghosts moving between us I hadn't seen before. Now I think of him and how the worst thing God could have done, he did lovingly. Needle and thread in hand, he stitched him together, breathed into his nostril, and brought forth his first cry and made him brown. If God had spared him, would he love himself? If God hadn't been so cruel, would he need lovers with loose hair, light eyes, and milk-colored skin to hand him the worth he swears he doesn't have? Would he need her to tell him he matters, to echo the words that weren't enough when I said them? What is validation and who can give it? Did he ever give it to me? Could I have ever given it to him? I look at my dark hair and eyes and skin and know the answer. I know when for a moment I imagine the girl softly whispering words into his ear, wrapping pale fingers around his brown hand. She makes him stronger, smarter, better. I remind him of everything he lacks. But when he talked of his pain, when he talked of the beautiful mean world and how it hurts the brown body, didn't he speak to me? Could he have spoken to her? The first time I truly completely fell in love, he later told me in a voice so soft and gentle it might have been spun from glass. In another world, you could be white. I looked at him, the one person who saw me, the first person I have loved and realized with a pain that maybe, just maybe, he didn't always see me or himself like I thought. Perhaps that what I had seen in him and what he had seen in me might have only been the momentary glimpses of a glowing brown body glowing soul freed from the ever-present genocide, the weight of not good enough. I thought maybe, just maybe, genocide is alive, virulent within him, further and deeper than I could have ever guessed. I want to believe that small things like the darkness of one's skin, the texture and hue of their hair, or the color of their eyes don't dictate who receives love and who does not. I want to believe lovers are not taken for what they can give or affirm, but for who they are. I want to believe that these things on the surface don't matter when souls match. I want to believe that people only see lovers because of love. But no matter how desperately I want to, I can't. Goodness. I want to ask you so many more things, um, but we're definitely getting close, and I want you to be able to bless us up with your last piece. So I know you wanted me to read Little Fires Left by Travelers, so I'm going to go uh, there. And... Um, then after that, I believe that you're going to read and then we're going to bid adieu. But um, honestly, it's just been such a pleasure speaking with you and reading with you. I respect this text so much. I'm definitely going to teach it. Um, I think that, again, the way you tackle so many of the issues that so many Black authors are afraid to touch is just so brave and beautiful. Thank you so much Thank for sharing you. this space with me, Catherine, seriously. Thank you so much. All right. This one's for you, my friend, Little Fires Left by Travelers. The smoldering stops me. I see my father in knee deep snow, wet white sticks to the blade. In grandpa's snowsuit, dad is blue flame. Come summer, he'll be nude under his overalls. Yes, no draws, letting it hang and swang straight raw. Newport shaking its red cherry, smoke trailing behind. Something kind of like the sparklers I use to write my name with on the 4th of July. Something not unlike lightning bugs fighting night with the shine of their asses. Dad's shotgun bucking all shrove and flash. Can I get a James Brown scream? My father's legless, not godless, charms the Lord with his tongue, reads the red words of Christ every time before I go. Thank you. And honestly, I think that one's my favorite. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you. Okay, so to close things up, this is the last piece in my book called Within the Veil, touching on W.E.B. Du Bois's idea of the veil of consciousness that Black Americans live in and under and how it affects our lives. So this is a quick quote from his book, The Souls of Black Folk. I, I who speak here am bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh of them that live within the veil. I imagine brown ancestors walking, shackled to one another at the ankles and the throat through a veil. They are coming from blazing heat and vast skies, lush trees and the smell of creation. Man first emerged here, walked upright into blinding daylight, let the sun kiss his flesh until it was baked black, smelling of fire. Negro. Brown skin, black hair, dark eyes. They're going to gray skies and rough seas, to bent backs and sweating brows, to boy, nigger, slut, missy. Shackled one another at the ankles and throat, piled one body on top of another like lumber stacked for maximum profit. The sons and daughters once held in the cradle in the tree of life, severed at the roots. As they play, as they pass through the veil, it does not fall back or glide over them. It clings, draping itself over their heads, against their eyes and, and in their mouths, obscuring their vision. They move forward, shuffling from warmth into darkness, from home and the diaspora, and so the veil falls over the last of them, covering every last body that was, every body that is, every body that is yet to come. They are a people who have passed through but not beyond, trapped in an endless tunnel that loops back into itself, a sepulchral labyrinth. We are those from within the veil. In some attempt at understanding what I knew myself to be, I said this again and again to make sense. I am a person who happens to be Black, not a Black person. Black was not a label, but a vague descriptor, something to encompass my features, my skin, my hair at most. Whatever a Black person was, I was not, though not because I didn't want to be. I used to say that no matter what color I was, I would essentially be the same person. I would be the same person who read Harry Potter books as a kid who felt most alive in the water. I would be the same person who was shy and quiet, who could not raise her voice higher than a baby yell, a shout of laughter. I would still listen to movie soundtracks and old rock and roll. I would still love Jesus and say my prayers each night. I would still talk clearly, enunciating my words like I was taught to in the fourth grade. There was no such thing as sounding white or being an Oreo. I was just being myself, as my parents had been themselves. In the 70s, they bonded over Elton John, James Taylor, and the Jackson Five. They played records of the Beatles and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which they later passed on to my sister and me. In the 80s, my father studied poetry and English and my mother biology and nursing. My father wore an afro and a jerry curl, my mother a press and a perm. They watched PB's Playhouse on Saturday mornings in the early years of their marriage and Martin on prime time. Both her family said they were a little weird, acted white. In the early 90s, they bore my sister and myself, and we heard the same things all through our childhood. Within this veil, there is not room for two warring souls, for a double consciousness. Everything is or it is not. I am either this or another thing entirely. Within the veil, everything is branded, stamped across the forehead with thick ink that reaches through the skin and into the brain, choking the synapses until they comply with the predisposed directive. It is a peculiar sensation this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. There might have been a moment when the world was not split straight down the middle, a moment before the when, when the veil fluttered momentarily and those on either side had a glimpse of what lay beyond their field of vision. For one, they saw a dark people wrapped in an inability to forget, to loosen the past. From the other, they saw a pale, muted world covered in a fog where shapes and shadows move about like ghosts. Scales on their eyes and cloth forced into their ears, bits in their mouths, hands shackled behind backs and souls chained to boulders, dragging them, dragging us, dragging me, down to the murky depths where the world rematerializes around us, both hazy and overbright, stark darkness. I hear a lone voice shouting, asking, hast thou seen sorrow in the dull waters of hopelessness? Hast thou known light? And I sit on the corner of the ghost worlds, spinning themselves outward, reaching into the world beyond the veil, a world I'll never really know. I ask myself how long I'll stay here in the in-between, eyes watching the shadows that rest between myself and everything I've ever wanted, ever hoped for. I ask God the Father to meet me here, ask the Son to walk me from one corner to the other, 
ask the Holy Ghost to touch the veil, turn it opaque so that I can at least see and then know. I feel his hand close over mine, the gentle pull as he brings me to my feet and guides my weak legs, my tired brown body, on. So good, so good. Everybody, thank you guys for hanging out with us and hearing us talk about what it means to us to be Black in America. And please go buy Catherine's book. Buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. I promise you will not be thank disappointed. You. Uh, yes, buy it, buy it. And um, I believe that all the proceeds from any book sales are going to such awesome organizations. I believe the yes. NAACP Legal Fund and even more. So uh, please, please buy books. Uh, buy Catherine's self-love kit. Please, please, please. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Douglas. This is amazing. And also, please buy his book if you haven't. It's been out in the world for a little while, but if you haven't come across it, pick it up. It's so good. Thank you. This is so much fun. I love talking with you. I loved it as well. Thank you so much. Bye, y'all. Bye.